Good evening to Joram. Good evening to Melody, Kevin and Innocent. Innocent, I'm very happy to see you. I want to thank the Lord for the fire he has led us. I hope you're blessed. Mm -hmm. Tonight we are looking at something very peculiar that many of us associate with, many of us do knowingly or unknowingly. And many of us have been accustomed to this lifestyle. Tonight we are looking at worship in truth. Our series of the last peculiar warnings are focusing on God's final messages to prepare the earth for his return. And Ellen White says that God has called the Seventh-day Adventist church and has cut it out with the mighty cleaver of truth, the three angels message that they may use it to prepare for a people that he will find ready when he comes. So there are messages that if not heeded, eternity might be forgotten. And I pray that tonight as we look at worship in truth, we may borrow a lesson or two and love the Lord more and live our lives in harmony with his will. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for tonight. Help us worship you in truth. Bring the knowledge that we seek to understand to our common understanding. I may the Holy Spirit inspire us. Them that will join us later, may they also be edified. They that will learn of this, I also pray for them at a later stage through the online arrangements. Bless us and let your word transform us to worship you in truth and in spirit. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. When we look at the theme, the, 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 where the two things coexist, worshiping and truth, they, they, are, they coexist in a few verses in the Bible. But allow me to start tonight's lesson in John chapter 4 and verse 23. It says, but the hour cometh. Now, this is... The first statement infers to a future stage, but the hour cometh. Then the second statement emphasizes the urgency and says, now is. Now, what means is that you've heard of someone says, I need that money as soon as yesterday. It means the need for worship has been. But the mm -hmm. fact that there's need the reason as to why the first statement is in the future is because this need has not been met. That is why he says, the hour cometh and now is. Therefore, it means that if now is the time, but the statement tells us that the hour is coming, it means that what is happening now is not the worship. Therefore, we are looking forward to what we've needed long before to happen. And that is what we are going to read next. So the hour cometh, and now is when true worshippers of God shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Listen to the last statement. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. So we're being told that the need for true worshippers that worship in spirit and in truth has been ongoing. Now is. But it has not happened. That is why we are looking towards that hour when it will actually happen. The question I want to ask you is, what is that decision you need to have done yesterday, which now is, but it will come? Now, I want us to look at worship, not just as convocation, not hymns, not Bible study, not prophecies. But I want us to look at worship as a lifestyle. When someone tells you, Tambula and Muganda, the kind of pride it inspires, the sense of belonging, the attitude and the motivations that you have is not just something that you hold when you're speaking. Uh, it is not just limited to telling us the cultural heritage. It's something that you live by. When you meet your totem, you don't associate. When you meet your clansmate, you relate. So worship 
is not something that we put on and put down in moments of devotion and on the holy convocation on Sabbath. No, lifestyle is what we abide by and it's what God wants. It's that which we live, the truth that we'll stand with and the worshiping that is in spirit that God has called us to do. And something to add, you know, in the Beatitudes, we are given blessings of what we would receive when we do particular things. But when you look at Hebrews, it says some things that please the Father, and that is faith. But here in John, we are told a kind of people that God wants to worship him. He wants those that are true, number one. Number two, that are worshiping in truth and in spirit. And verse 24 says, for God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth so the question is what is truth john 17 17 simplifies it sanctify them by thy truth thy word is what is truth so the worshiping of truth in this world where truth is relative in this world where absoluteness is now being questioned mm -hmm. the only way we can be sure of what truth is is by looking at scripture and scripture has told us truth is the word of God. Sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is what? Is truth. Let's also see what the psalmist says. The psalmist in 138 verse 2 says, I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. Listen to the next statement. For thou has magnified thy word above thy name. Now, God has put his word, his truth, the Bible above his name. What does that mean? If any of us wanted to badmouth, let me use innocent. You'll forgive me for using you tonight. If someone wanted to assassinate your character, talk about maybe you stole particular resources, you've got someone pregnant or you did something evil, it would be something that you would be quick to defend. As compared to when someone says, innocent said so and so, said this and this. Sometimes we are not very quick to defend the words that they accuse us for. But whenever it comes to the name, the reputation, the character, when it's being assassinated, we are quick. But God is telling us that he has put, oh my God, he has magnified his word above his name. So God is not worried in as much as he commands us not to take his name in vain. God is not as worried about we heeding his word as much as we would take his name. Meaning that what is most important is not how we refer to God, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Shiro, whatever. I'm sorry to use if some of these things are wrong. But however we refer to God is not the most important. The question of true worship, the question of worshiping in truth is your adherence, your understanding, your allegiance and obedience to the word. So the worshippers of truth or they that worship in truth are they that have purpose like the psalmist says thy word have i kept in my heart that what i may not sin against you so when the scripture is talking about worshiping in truth and we're being told the truth is the word and we're being told that god has put his word above his name we are being told that god as the psalmist says he has hid his word that he may not sin it means True worship is a life of the word of God hid so deep within that sin is not our common destiny. Mm -hmm. So the call for true worship is a call to have the word of God embedded, engrafted, imputed, and whatever words you can use to emphasize the need for this word to be assimilated in our systems until we live a life that we sin not. So allow me to say true worship is overcoming sin. Are we together? True worship is victory over sin. And God is looking for a people who will not do this on their own because it is him that works in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. There's a warning that we receive in Romans chapter 1 verse 25. It says, who changeth the truth? We have seen who changes the truth. What is truth? Truth is the word of God. Who changes truth of God into a lie and worshiped? So you see how the relationship of truth, the word, and worship. The moment you alter truth, the moment you alter the word of God, sometimes many of us don't alter it, but we take it for granted. 
we pick portions to adhere to. We choose what to believe and what not to believe. We choose what to use and what not to use. The moment we take the word of the Lord mm -hmm. as a lie, and taking the word of God as a lie is not necessarily you lying about scripture or misinterpreting it, no. If someone told you, come at 11 and you show up at midday, you've taken his statement as a lie. You think he will not show up at 11. So many of us have been called by God. I want us to pick the peculiar things in this message. We've been called by God to a particular standard. And because we take it for granted, understand me properly. Some of us have a deliberate effort to keep this word, but we fall short. I'm talking about some of us who take this for granted and not heed it. And the moment we take that, we are taking God for a lie. The word of God for a lie. The verse continues in Romans 1.25. Who has changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the, create, the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever? Amen. Now, whose word have you adhered to? Is it the word of God or the word of a creature? A creature is man, an animal. But in this case, I want us to look at fellow creatures, fellow homo sapiens, human beings who have been created in the image of God, whose word we've taken more than we should. The question is, if Dr. Kasenene speaks about wellness, how quick are you to listen as compared to when Leviticus talk about, talks about unclean foods? Many of us value opinions of homo sapiens, of creatures, more than we value the opinion of God. God will straight away tell you, don't dress like this, don't eat like this, but you'd want to seek the opinion of a pastor. You'd want the, the opinion of Biaruhang, innocent as a spiritual man. You'd want the opinion of Joram as a benevolent Christian. The question is, have you chosen to call God a liar by not heeding his word and choosing something else, either feebles or whatever you choose to have? My prayer is that for you to worship in truth, the word of God should proceed before the word of man or of any creature. In Revelation 14, as we sum the second angel's message or the second, the second warning, and remember this series we are looking at the normal message, but picking out peculiar things. And the first thing we looked at is worship is a lifestyle. Number two, true worshipers or true worship is victory over sin that comes in the power of Christ. Now, Revelation reminds us that the second, the first angel says with a loud voice, fear God and give him glory. Sorry, the first angel, for the hour of his judgment has come. We looked at fear and give glory. We looked at uh, the hour of judgment or judgment is come. Tonight, we are looking at worship him that made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and the fountains of water. Now, in, Ro in Romans chapter one, the authority of worship is bestowed on the creator, not the creature. So we again now see who should we worship and why. The sole reason as to why we need to worship God is because he is creator. In our local languages, God is translated as creator in most mm -hmm. prefects. He's either Ruhanga to mean he's a creator. He's created as, he's called Katonda, Anyesaye, uh, like a porter, all these things refer to God's overarching, unique attribute as a creator. It cannot be replicated. Many of us can be manufacturers, we can be innovators, but we cannot bring nothing, some, something out of nothing. And therefore, God has a right to claim our worship because he has put in place where there was now. So when we look at true worship, there's another thing that I want us to take note as we continue. Is that if true worship is inclined to the word of God, and the word of God, if we look at the psalmist, he says, out of the word of God, he esteems his law. God saw that his word should be inspired by men, but he chose particular things to write himself. The first thing he wrote was the Ten Commandments. In Daniel, we see him come and write Mene, Mene, Tekel, Ulf, Sin. But I want us to pick, why did God decide to write the Ten Commandments? Even after Moses was overwhelmed by the apostasy and broke them, God just told him, cut stone, bring them. He wrote the Ten Commandments twice for us. 
And my prayer is that you'll understand that even in as much as his word is all inspired, some of portions of scripture are more close to his heart and once heeded, they're more blessed. Let me also bring this home, that in as much as the law is something that God cherishes above all his word, there are even portions in that word, the law, that are more peculiar. So if we look at the worship being for the creator, the question that we need to understand is, who is this creator? That's God. Where is his territory? Heaven, earth, the sea, and the fountains thereof. And when we continue understanding this, the question that should also arise to you is, where do we find the attributes, the stamp of God in this law? Where does God lay his mark as the creator and claim authority above everything? And the truth, my brother, is in the fourth commandment. God in the fourth commandment shows us who he is, what he has done for man, and why he deserves to be worshipped. And the fourth commandment tells us that God is he that created in six days. And when he created in six days, mm -hmm. the reason as to why I want us to look at this verse is that in the, on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. And he blessed, sanctified, and set this Sabbath aside as a day for worship, as a day for rest, as a day where man can enjoy the communion of his creator and receive of the blessings ideal to the image he was created in, and above all, to realize the promise of where and how he will be restored. So worshiping in truth starts with our belief and absolute assuredness that we can overcome sin. Number one. Number two, it comes in the fact that worship is not a something that we do and finish. Worship is a lifestyle. And the ultimate view of a lifestyle that is of a true worshiper is a lifestyle that has overcome sin and all its consequences. My prayer, my brother, tonight is that you will understand that true worshipers are not them that come at eight at church in as much as coming early is part of true worship. But it's them who live a life that points to the fact that there is a God in heaven whom they love so dearly that their life is counted, numbered after his instruction, numbered and counted after his word. Now, these particular people have associated themselves with the pinnacle of his cherished word, and that's the Ten Commandments. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ or the faith of Jesus Christ. Now, the Ten Commandments also have a peculiar commandment. And that's the commandment that shows us the authority of God as creator who deserves worship. And this commandment continues to tell us, in, if you read the word of God entirely, in Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 20, it tells us that the Lord gave us his Sabbath as a proof that he is our God. Ezekiel 20, 20 says, and allow my Sabbaths that they may be a sign between me and you that ye may know that I am the Lord, your God. So in keeping the Sabbath, the true Sabbath, the seventh day Sabbath, that is Saturday, you and I are proclaiming that God is creator, that God is all powerful. And above all things, we are proclaiming that we have no other responsibility to worship anything or anyone but God. And tonight I want to ask you, my brother, my sister, to have faith that he who has called you to be perfect as he is perfect will make you perfect. And victory over sin is looking at worship as a lifestyle, as a character, as a way of life. We will realize that in the power and the grace of Jesus Christ. I also want to encourage you that if you've fallen short, give up not, because we have victory in the name of Jesus. Now, one thing we need to be careful, the reason as to why I wanted to emphasize this is the danger that is in false worship. The truth is that false worship opens a can of worms. False worship opens the door for temptation. Let's look at what Ellen White tells us in Prophets and Kings. He says, sorry, she says, Thus when the people of Israel, in their worship of Baal and Astrogoth, paid supreme homage to the forces of nature, like we've seen in Romans, that instead of worshipping the creator, we worshipped, they were worshipping the creature. Instead of paying supreme homage 
to the sorry they paid supreme homage to the forces of nature they served mm -hmm. their connection and with all that is lift uplifting and ennobling they fell an easy prey to temptation with the defenses of the soul broken down that is in false worship the misguided worshipers had no i repeat had no barrier against sin and yielded themselves to the evil passions of the human heart allow me share with you that if we are to see a change in this world where evil where people don't submit to their lower powers where people are reasonable where homosexuality is unheard of all these things stemmed from the misguiding of worship where attention was given to creatures and not the creator and the prayer that i have tonight is that we will awake in as much as many of us might celebrate in the fact that we worship a living god and at the same time we worship him on the true sabbath the question that i have for you is that the ultimate crown of true worship is victory over sin and what efforts are you putting in place to overcome sin what are you doing to be able to protect your soul your heart your mind from sin and as we've seen false worship worshiping of creature uplifting creation above the creator is the gateway to error and damnation and my prayer tonight is that you will choose to take the lord as he has spoken and you will serve him in truth and in spirit and when you've realized how much he has done for you you will purpose to overcome sin not in your own merit or power but in christ who has blessed us so may this peculiar warning stand out to re remind you that true worship is not a one day event we don't watch step in worship and step out no true worship is a lifestyle a lifestyle that has failures where sin can at times beguile us but the ultimate truth is that this worship leads us to victory over sin and may the lord bless you as you purpose within your heart to overcome sin and when the role is called up yonder you'll be able to inherit the kingdom of god so may the lord bless you and keep you until he comes to identify with you as true worshipers that will inherit the kingdom of god let us pray thank you heavenly father for the love you've shown humanity and for the blessings that we have which have established us this far lord put your word within us that we may not sin against you and not sinning against you being true worship that in the end will overcome sin and be assimilated in your true image as true worshipers may this word sanctify us may your truth be established in us that we may walk not after the flesh but after the spirit bless us heavenly father lead us in ways of righteousness for your own sake bless every individual that has purpose to learn and study with us in a special way father i pray that you will visit and meet the needs of every one of your children father bless joram bless jennifer bless ian innocent deo melody margaret kevin and rosebell and father hear all their needs but above all help us to worship you truly and when you call us may we be found worthy worthy to inherit your kingdom we thank you and pray that from now on you'll help us live lives that worship you even when it's not sabbath even after sabbath that lives that honor and glorify you we thank you in jesus name amen